Hello and welcome to the Global webinar about advanced steel design using RFM. My name is Walter Rustler. Today we will see how to model steel details in RFM. We'll also talk about meshing options that we have in RFM and then we will take a closer look at the elastic and plastic de design cap capabilities inside RFM and the additional modules. When designing elastic and plastic um, models in for surfaces in RFM, we need additional modules. The main modules that we need are RF steel, which is a stress analysis, um, which compares existing stresses to a fixed allowable stress. We also need RF mod NL, which gives us nonlinear material model capabilities, and this is required for a plastic design. If we talk about stability analysis, we need um, additional modules RF stability and RF imp. Uh, we can then do a analysis against buckling and we can do this in elastic and plastic way. The procedure is to first have a linear analysis in RFM for a surface model. Uh, we need then a imperfection and the imperfection can be derived from a buckling mode that is calculated in RF stability. We scale this imperfection mode to a certain size and use the imperfect model then as, for a, as a basis for a nonlinear analysis and stress analysis. And we check then if the stresses are below the uh, limit stresses. Important is that we use a nonlinear analysis for this uh, check. We will see this in the live demonstration. During the live demonstration, you have the option to ask some questions and my colleague Robert Vogel will help me to answer those questions and you can type the questions in the little toolbox you see in the uh, webinar software control panel. In the live presentation, we'll take a look at a part of a frame, steel frame, and uh, the steel frame could be something like this. It consists out of a tapered column and also a tapered part of the beam. And we do not model as a surface model the entire frame. We could do it, but it would of course take a longer time because we have more finite elements to take care of. So we isolate the part of the structure and it is in this case the column and uh, part of the beam of the tapered beam. In general, um, you will not find an analytical solution for checking against local buckling of uh, such parts where the bending moment has to be introduced over a corner of a frame into the column. Um, analytical formulas for plate buckling are available in, to my knowledge only for rectangular plates. If we have a not a rectangular plate or a certain type of supporting of the rectangular plate or a certain type of stress introduction into the shear or buckling panel, then it is better to do a analysis within a finite element software. I now change to the uh, RFAM software and we start with modeling uh, the structure. In order to make this a little bit shorter, I have already prepared part of the structure, which is the column. And we see here the column consists out of actually um, three different types of plates. 
The web is an 8 millimeter thick plate and then the flanges are made from 15 millimeters and the end plate here is a 12 millimeter plate. We need now to model the beam that um, or the part of the beam which is also uh, tapered. We can do it in different ways. One way I can show you today is to extrude lines into surfaces. I select the lines and I uh, go then to extrude line into surface and when I do this I get a dialog where I can set the material for the new surface. I can set the, first of all I set the direction with, which is the global axis C and I see a little bit, a little preview of the surface and the length should be in this case 1.5 meters. The thickness of the plate should be the same as the end plate on top of the column which is 12 millimeters. And with this I can just press apply and I create a couple of surfaces. Next I'll create the end plate of the beam uh, which is now in direction plus C and the length is not 1500 but uh, 600 millimeters. The thickness should be let's say 25 millimeters. On apply I get also this part of the structure and I also can go back into minus x direction. Maybe I choose here uh, 1 meter length uh, and again 12 meter, 12 millimeters of thickness. On apply I get my flanges and the end plate created. Uh, what I'm missing now is the connection to the bottom part of the column and I can do this if I would have here a connection node or um, actually I want to have it on a certain distance and the way I can do it I can just create a division point on the lines. Uh, for this it is important to know that the lines are modeled from bottom to top and I can just select the lines, right mouse click on one line and choose the command uh, divide with distance. I want to divide it from the top, it is from the end and I choose here 0.794 millimeters for, uh, for example. On OK I get here the division points. Next I can select the end points of the surface and just drag and drop them and they will snap to those other nodes. So this way I have the taper here very quickly uh, modeled. Next I need the web. Um, I can just simply select the boundary lines for the web. Thickness should be 8 millimeters again it's a standard plate element and I just select the boundary lines. Okay, this way I created very rapidly this beam part of the model. I'd like to point out a few other things before we go on. In the display tree here I can show the surface axis system and when I show this I see here there are some unregularities. Um, this is important if you do steel stress analysis in such models because all the stresses will refer to the local axis of the plate system predominantly. So um, if I have different orientations in these local systems when I show different stresses I will, in, I will see inconsistent stress uh, diagrams along the surfaces because if I say for example I want to see sigma x plus which is on the 
positive side of the local z-axis of the surface, then I see different values for both surfaces here. So, because the plus side in the left part of the flange here is upwards and the minus side is downward. So, if I want to see the stress on the outside of the flange, um, I, I, it's a good idea to reverse the local axes so they match. For this, I select the surface and use the option reverse local axis system and then the axes are um, yeah, identical for both parts of the flange. Here I can do the same thing and click, right mouse click there, reverse local axis system. And the same thing I will do down here, I'll make the model in such way that the local axis predominantly go downward reverse local axis system. Here there is another specialty because um, in the longitudinal direction of the flange uh, we have the y-axis and not the x-axis. This is because uh, the lower flange is not horizontal and it's a little bit out of the plane. Um, how can I fix this? Um, it is possible. Uh, for this, uh, I can use following option. I double click on the surface, I go to access, and here I find access for input. Default, the software chooses the direction. I can rotate it by a certain angle, or I can use uh, axis, and I can point to a line which will give the direction of the axis. So, I pick, for example, the center line here. OK, and on OK, um, the axis system is moved to the center line, but it's still wrong. The reason for this is it's because the line also points in this direction. The same as the surface, I can click on the line, and I also can reverse the line orientation. And now it's in the direction I want to, and I can do this same thing for the other part of the flange. Axis pick the template and click OK. It is important that you can check this. Um, this way you also can, for example, model um, circles or circle surfaces and the local axis system will follow um, the perimeter of the, of the circle or the radiant of the circle. Um, it is a, a important feature if you deal with such structures. Okay, let's check the web also. Um, we have here um, the plus C direction of the beam and the column are different, so I do the same thing again for the column. Okay, now when I look at sigma x on the top flange, I get the same result. Uh, for all the flanges and I don't have to think uh, which part of the structure I look at. Okay, I'm done with this and I can um, hide the axis system again. Okay, next I'll need some supports um, at the base of the column. I'll model a fixed support and I can do this simple if I use a type of support uh, hinged um, and assign this to all the lines at the end of the surfaces here. So because none of the lines can move neither horizontally nor vertically, it creates some kind of a fixation. Also, I need some lateral support. So, I assume the knee here is held by some bracing in longitudinal building direction and maybe some purlins are there. So, I create a new nodal support that acts only in Y direction and I assign this 
to the center here of the top of the column. And also at the end of the haunch here there should be some rotational restraints. So I have a fork type support basically that is horizontally and kind of holds the beam against rotation. If you find the support symbols too big you can right click on it and decrease the size or you can change it also into in the uh, on the right click in the display properties. Okay one more nodal support I put here on the compression flange of the column to stabilize the column and it should be of the same type only horizontal in y direction. I do this uh, for one reason to um, make it happen that we have here then later on when we do stability analysis a local buckling as the first buckling modes. Um, not in every case we have a local buckling of the web depends on the thickness of the web and the flanges and etc. Okay the model I think is so far okay maybe to give you a better idea I can show some dimensions. Um, we have here the depth of the beam here is about one meter so when I take a look at the distance from the center node here to the edge we have two meters so if we introduce here a load a vertical load it will create here a bending moment um, the amount of the load times two meter so we have some idea what what are the forces that act here the entire column is about seven meter seven meters in uh, height okay also um, I need to talk now about loading. We need to apply some load. Uh, when I do the loading, I can, um, I could also add here some beam elements and then model the rest of the frame, for example, as as a member model, and then put the loads on the members, and the loads would be introduced automatically through the member but I uh, do here now a individual loading with a vertical load. Typically what you should not do is to introduce the load on one finite element point node so it's better to distribute the load along the uh, depth of the beam and the length of this center line here is uh, 600 millimeters just remember this and if I want to introduce a bending moment of about 360 kilometer in the center of the column I need approximately because we have here two meters approximately 180 kilonewton uh, of force here in the end of the beam so and now if I want to do some kind of parametric uh, analysis um, I could analyze it 180 kilonewtons divided by 0.6 meters and I would get the value but um, I have to do this each time I would change the force um, I show you how we could do it a little bit more elegant in the software first I create a new load case it should be a, a without self-weight and it should be a geometrically linear static analysis. I call it design load and let's assume in this load we have all safety factors and everything is in there. Linear first order theory. In this load case I create now my load and I create first a parameter that's called also design load. The unit of this parameter is force and the magnitude should be 180 kilonewton. Now I will apply this force on this line. So I create a new line load in direction global related to the true line length and I don't know the value here I would have to figure it out but in RFM you can use uh, 
the formulas and the formulas use the parameters that I just defined. So I can use that parameter and multiply it by 0 0.6 meters. We always use basic SI units and we see here uh, there is uh, a load of um, 0.6 meters that's uh, not divided we have to not multiplied we have to divide it and then there is a load of 300 kilonewton per meter by applying the formula this value will be automatically entered here we see here a small triangle that uh, signals the formula and on OK I can assign the load here at the end of the line if I want to change the load now I simply go to the parameter say 160 and if I click OK the load will change but I want to use 180 so I change it back just as an idea how RFM helps you with such kinds of problems okay before we can run the analysis we'll need to talk about a finite element mesh you find it in calculate finite element finite element mesh settings the important parts of this dialog here are a the target lengths of the finite elements it's set here now to 50 millimeters um, it can be changed to any size this will be the target length and orphan will try to make finite elements with the mesh length no longer than 50 millimeters um, I'm not pointing out all the details here for this uh, dialogue but I point out the most important settings um, first of all we can uh, have some influence on the shape of the finite elements they can be only uh, rectangular or we call them quadrangle they can be triangular only and they can be a mixture of triangles and quadrangles uh, we found that this mixture is giving us the best results um, uh, triangular meshes are not necessarily uh, uh, lower in in quality it depends on what type of uh, elements you have and um, some feet some surfaces cannot be created with just rectangular uh, mesh shapes so for us this seems to be the most practical way but however if you want to you can select different settings here and also we try to use identical squares or rectangles where it is possible um, the software decides whether to use a triangle or a rectangle uh, on the relation between the lengths of the two diagonals so first it creates rectangles and then checks the diagonals and if they exceed a certain ratio that you can set here it will make uh, triangles so you have an influence also with this parameter to make it a little bit more or less rectangular or triangular we can check the option that we will update the mesh each time I click on OK if I change something the mesh will be automatically created on OK I create the mesh and we can take a look at the mesh first of all I have to show the mesh which you can control here in the display navigator finite element mesh and we see here um, there is a significant amount of mesh cells along the depth of the beam and the girder uh, and the column and we have two um, elements along each side of the flange which might be a little bit low but if you want to you can change it you can make a finer mesh overall or you can double click on each surface and you have here FE mesh settings as well and you can have a so-called mesh refinement on each surface if you want to you can make it finer now if I do this I do this once here click on OK only in this surface we will have a finer mesh and once I create the finite element mesh or I click on OK it takes a little bit longer now to create that mesh 
And of course, you have a very fine mesh here now and the transition from the rough mesh to the finer mesh is done here over certain um, cells here of, of the mesh, which is well, um, better. So we have some um, smooth transition from the coarse to the finer mesh. Um, this will create, of course, a longer calculation time and uh, you should think about whether you need a real fine mesh or whether you maybe you can get by with a coarse mesh. This depends really on the structure. In generally, we say uh, you should have maybe uh, four to six elements along such a surface uh, of interest. If you don't really have uh, detailed interest in the results, you maybe get by with a more coarse uh, mesh. I will delete this uh, surface mesh refinement um, and stick with the regular mesh that we have here and create this one more time. Okay, I think now we are ready to run the linear analysis. Um, by the way, I have here um, four different thicknesses and I show the panel of the thicknesses in this structure with the fuse um, tree. You can here activate, um, actually I wanted to show the display tree. With the display tree you can show here the colors in the rendered structure by surface thickness. By default we have your materials and the scale will be gone. But if you have here uh, surface thickness, you see here the colors and you can check whether everything is correct. Also, you can uh, check whether the plus or the minus surface side uh, uh, gets also different colors. You can check it as well as here. It's a good thing to control um, structures if they, if they have different orientation. The plus and the minus side will have different uh, color. Yeah? So you see here that for example the web has all the same orientation if you look at it from the other side it has a different color. So this is also a good way to control if everything is correct. Um, we stay with the thickness maybe. All right, uh, to run the analysis I just simply say here show results and it will start the analysis. Now we have, I forgot to tell you, we have steel as a material and it's linear elastic. What I see here are, well, I see here first a new result, navigation tree that starts with deformation uh, and I can check if my results are okay. I can hide, for example, the load. Uh, and on the side, hide my loads, okay, um, and I can see if everything is symmetric. Huh? So there should be not no deformation in y direction and in x direction of course, but everything looks looks good. Um, I also should take a look at my basic forces, like I have bending moments and that should be also symmetric. I have bending moments the other direction and I have axial forces and if I have everything correct then I get a nice symmetric view. This is a good way how to control if your input is correct. Yeah? Also here if I have a force downward here there should be tension. So orange if I look here it's positive so it's tension. Blue is compression so it looks to be okay. Uh, same way is with the stresses. I can go down and I can show sigma x, I can show sigma y on the positive side, for example, sigma x and sigma x on the negative side. So there are different different values. Huh? If I click, go here, there should be uh, different, should be visible and it's uh, important to have the directions correctly. Um, important is also maybe to look at the equivalent stress from Mises. If I look here, 
I get a nice smooth display of my equivalent stress. But I only see the existing stress. I don't know do I have stress over the yield strength, for example. To do this, I'll have to take a look at RF steel surfaces. Inside RF steel surfaces, we can check against a limiting stress. It's a quite simple model, model, module. We have the ultimate limit state design case and we check here our design load case. I could do also deflection, so it will check some deflection, but in this case, deflection is out of scope. So I see here all my materials and my yield strengths for different material thicknesses, which is also important because in uh, if you have if you work with thick materials, you can have different yield strengths for different thicknesses. The surfaces are listed here, and with this I can maybe I check the details. In the details, I have options to set the individual stress types. I can check my limit deflections for the stability limit states, and in the options I have the options to say. Um, the important things are distribution of internal forces and it's set to continuous within surface. I will come back to this point later. Maybe because I read it here, one important thing results in FE mesh points and grid points. Um, there is an important thing which I have to show maybe after I go back to RFM. Let's first start with calculation of the stresses and comparison to the limit stress. I run the analysis and I see here now I have shear stress, main stress, positive side, negative side, medium or, or membrane stress and equivalent stress um, which is exceeded by a ratio of 2.67. And you see here also if I click here where this ex uh, exceeding part is uh, typically, it is now here where we have this compression point. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this in the graphics. And we see here, actually, this is the stress. I have a different tree again here in our steel surfaces case, where I also can show the stress ratio for sigma equivalent. And I see here everything that is above one is really dark red and here we have some problems, some local uh, overstress that I need to take care of. But I was talking about uh, grid points and mesh points. It's important to know that each surface has also an overlaying grid which can be controlled also for each surface. It's set here very coarse. Um, it, it's good to have, for example, if you work with concrete plates that are wide in dimensions and you can then control the output of the numerical values um, by grid points or by mesh points. Um, in RF steel surfaces, I have also the option to set, do I want to see grid points or mesh points? If I say grid points, I have to recalculate and there will be less points. So Mesh points is a good idea for such so small uh, dimensions. And also here I have the option to result in mesh points and grid points. So this is why it's there. If you want to reserve some uh, capacity of the material for other things, you can um, reduce the allowable stress ratio to 0.8, 0.6. By default it's set to 1. Okay. So, um, now we have the problem that we have um, some places where we have too much stress. So, what to do with it? Um, we'll do a um, plastic analysis. So, this is the stress ratio. And um, how can I do it? For this, I go back to the material table, and in the material table, or you can also do it in the in the data navigator here, you have here materials, and you can edit the materials as well here. You have your different material models. 
uh, by default, RFAM comes with the isotropic linear elastic material model. And you can also use the autotropic elastic 2D material model. All the other material models are part of RFMAT NL, which is an additional module that will uh, set free those options. And there is an isotropic plastic 1D model, which is for plastic analysis of beams on the elements. There is an isotropic plastic 2D, 3D material model that we'll take a look pretty soon. There is an orthotropic elastic 2D model, which allows you to have different uh, stiffnesses in two different directions on a surface. There is an orthotropic 3D uh, model, which is a more advanced um, model for 3D. Um, and which which has autotrophy in three directions as X, Y, and C. And uh, the same thing is also possible for plastic design. Uh, an interesting thing for steel design is also isotropic uh, thermal elastic, which allows you to set different stiffnesses, different elasticity modulus, moduli for different temperatures. So if you have a heated structure, the material gets softer. Um, we have isotropic masonry 2D, which is um, for masonry and it, it, it excludes the tension stress on masonry and allows only some uh, bending stiffness. Um, what is of interest for us in the steel design here now is isotropic plastic 2D, 3D. We have to delete the results, which is clear because we changed the material model. And in this model, uh, we'll refer to the von Mises uh, stress. It's a plastic design approach. So in each iteration step, we compare for each finite element mesh um, um, cell. We compare the existing stress to the yield strengths. And if it is higher, we will choose the stiffness in a certain way. So the stress will then redistribute uh, over several iterations into the neighboring finite element uh, meshes. Um, the yield strengths will be entered here. It's set now to S235. Uh, we have a bilinear model in this case, so we can model some uh, strain hardening above the yield strengths. You can also use a diagram. The diagram in this case is identical for tension and compression. Um, as a simplified model for trying things out, you can do a linear elastic only, which is the same as we had before. Um, I use the basic function with a yield strength of 23.5, typically for such cases here. OK, another material model, this was for on Mises stresses. Another material model that is interesting for steel structures in this type is the nonlinear elastic 2D uh, model, which is similar to what we've seen just now, has the similar options, the same options, but it behaves, it can behave also differently um, in compression and tension, which the other model cannot. Um, and also, um, it uh, refers to the principal stresses. Um, if, you, if you use the Van Mises stresses, there can be situations where the principal stresses are higher than the Van Mises stress. So you do not get the worst situation, I would say. Um, but it depends on uh, regulations that you have to follow, which type of stress you have to check. Um, I use this model now. Uh, and I use the basic function with a limit, a yield strength limit of 23.5 kilonewton per square centimeters. Okay, since all the surfaces use the same material, all the surfaces can now yield. Okay, let's take a look maybe um, at the results and I calculate this first load case nonlinear now, um, you will see there are some iterations now. First of all, we see here load incrementals. 
and we see different iterations because we have to check in each iteration um, what is the yield strength in each finite element mesh and how we have to change it. It's also a good idea to work with load increments because you gradually um, load the structure and yielding starts gradually at the worst points and spreads then from there. If you have a large yielding area and you apply the load in one step, um, it is kind of, we call it sometimes called shock for the structure because uh, there's a big change in the strength of the structure and in the stiffness of the structure and it can lead to um, not so good convergence uh, during the uh, calculations. Um, yeah, what we see here now um, is again the equivalent stress max von Mises and we see here it's still quite high, it's not 23.5. Um, what is the problem? I have to explain a few things. Um, first of all, um, we change for each mesh cell, we change the stiffness and um, therefore it is not a good idea to, to smooth the results that what we do uh, by default over all uh, surfaces and RFAM has a way, um, some specialty how to uh, display results. In generally you want to you get rough results and you want to smooth them over one surface but um, when we look at the plastic design and we change only the results per finite element mesh um, with one uh, let's say elasticity modulus, um, then we have a constant stiffness over the mesh and we cannot uh, look or change the stiffness over the mesh in each point. Yeah? So uh, therefore we have to take a look at the results constant per mesh. Um, we can do this here with surfaces in the display navigator under results surfaces distribution of internal forces stresses continues within surfaces so I mesh it I, I smooth it over each surface I can say non-continuous you see there's a little bit of difference maybe I change the smoothing yeah? and I can say constant yeah? and if I go to constant on element you see here that my uh, stress is not red anymore. Um, maybe I have to show this also in the result navigator a little bit different. Um, in the result navigator I have the same trees as I have before um, but I have additionally also uh, crit criterions. Yeah? Criteria and one criteria is the design ratio here because we have a yield stress we can compare existing stress to the um, limit stress and here we see um, we have here now utilization ratio 1 uh, we see here also with the non-linearity rate where we have some yielding that happened yeah. and we should also take a look at the strains um, and the strains should not be larger than 2% so um, once the material yields the force will stay the same inside the uh, material but it I can uh, kind of uh, elongate it as long as I can but the, the strains cannot be uh, unlimited so in general the limit is point uh, is two percent so 0 0.02 and we here have uh, no problem we are far away from that Okay, design ratio is clear um, and we can take also a look at the real stresses and there we should have now only stresses uh, that are below 23.5 and we see that is here the case. Maybe to explain a little bit more about this um, smoothing, I can display here again um, the 
different options, but I also show the results. I show the result values, um, not the extreme values. I want to see everything. Um, uh, on grid, design load, on grid in FE mesh points. So now we see here, if I look for each cell here, I see there is one value for each surface. If I go back to display and change it to non-continuous, I will see I get, take some time, I get for each finite element, for each connecting mesh cell, I get one value because I have four elements in this case, I have four values and they're slightly different. So these are the values that I get from the calculation, but nobody wants to work with such values. That's why we smooth them. In generally, we smooth them. So within each surface, we make it, we, we make the average of all four values and display the average value. Uh, if you talk about stresses, we cannot go over the surface edge because um, stresses are different when there's a different thickness. And if I smooth over the surface edge, I would make a mistake. This is why here are two values because we have different thickness here in the flange as we have in the web. If I smooth continuously total, then I get one value also here. But the results are, you know, I, I, there's a thick material, I have low stress, and there's a thin material, I have high stress, and make the average, which is not correct here. I have to, to um, stay within the surface. And this is why continuous with surface is uh, on default, and which is good in this case. Um, for elastic design, if I do plastic design, I have to look at the constant on element results always and I get a averaged value for each mass cell. So uh, it's also important to know um, that I hide the values again um, that in that case uh, the mesh might have to be a little bit more finer when I do a plastic design because um, I can then in a smaller grade uh, change the stiffness on the structure. So therefore, in structures like this, or where there's some kind of points that are difficult, I can also introduce a another mesh refinement for a node. I create a new one on this node. I create a rectangular or circular refinement, and by default, RFM uh, creates a radius five times the global target length of the mesh and uh, the outer length should be the target length, which is compatible with the other mesh, and the inner length is five times smaller. If I do this, I have to erase the results and do one more analysis. Run this analysis, and then we continue with the uh, buckling uh, check. Okay, um, load increments, one more time I explained already, I have to show you where I can uh, set those options. Those are in the calculation parameters, um, you can set uh, increments. It's by default, I think, set to five. Um, if there is problems with convergence, you get a message and you can change it. Um, if not, um, maybe you can st stick with less increments and increase the um, speed of the calculation this way. Okay, we're still okay. We have for MISA stress 20.85. Also in the RF steel module, if I go there, I can start it here again. I can, as I sh showed you before, I can set those values here constant on elements. So also here, here's this setting. If I calculate it, I should get same results and the utilization ratio is one in this case. Okay, great, we are done with stresses, everything is fine and we don't have to do anything. Well, we haven't looked at stability yet. It's a very slender structure and 
when we look at stresses, we have no check about buckling, about local buckling, flange buckling, web buckling. Uh, this is not checked. How can I do this? Um, as I showed you in the introduction, we need to have uh, imperfection. We need to scale the imperfection to a certain way, and we need to have a certain sh uh, shape of the imperfection. For this, I use the module RF stability to create shapes uh, and to create to find out the critical buckling load. Actually, RF stability can be started by double clicking on it, and I, by default, I analyze for eigenvalues, this should be enough. Um, I have to enter a load case as a basis for this eigenvalue analysis. I need the axial forces in this eigenvalue problem uh, to find the eigenvalues. And I have only one load case, so I use this one. It's the one basically that I want to refer my critical load factors to. Um, I can run an eigenvalue analysis or I can also an incremental load analysis. That means I run a nonlinear analysis inside RFM and gradually increase the load until I get the instability message. Um, the difference is that I also take into account force risk or stress risk uh, redistributions during the iterations, failing members, and all those things are taken into account. While the eigenvalue analysis takes the axial force level from this load case, the stiffness matrix from this load case, and runs the eigenvalue analysis based on this. And there's no redistribution. And those are actually the two important features here. Um, you can choose between launchers, roots of characteristic polynomial, subspace iteration method, which is also very common, and there is a Another iterative method, which is the ICG method, which is less demanding on memory, but also takes longer. OK, with this, I run the analysis. And I get four eigenvalues after a short time. I get the critical load factor, um, which is, um, which is uh, an, a name, or which is a a number, a figure that tells me how far I'm away from from an instability status. Um, I can load, I can increase the load 1.4 times and then I get this buckling mode that is displayed in the back. And then there's a second one and a third one and so on. And this factor shows me that there is some danger and I have to do a nonlinear analysis and maybe also take into account local buckling. OK, let's take a look into the uh, full graphics. And here we see the first mode. And the first mode is this buckle here. And um, you have to check the lowest eigenvalue modes and do a nonlinear analysis on an imperfect structure. So I will use this buckling mode to do um, a nonlinear analysis and I need to create an imperfect shape from this. How can I do this? I go to the module RF imp and in RF imp you can create imperfections you can you can make a predeformed initial model. It will stretch or change the finite element mesh according to a deformation of an RFM load case or according to a buckling shape from the module RF stability. And I choose the first buckling shape, which is what I see here. Now I need to scale it. And I have the option here to enter a ordinate for the scaling. So I multiply, I scale it uh, to uh, 20 millimeters in this case. I'll tell you in a second why 20 millimeters. Um, um, a buckling shape is uh, normalized or standardized. That means it has basically no direction and also no size. And by this ordinate, I give the deformation a certain size. I get this as numbers, and I can look at it also graphically. Actually, if I want to um, 
show it on the other side, I put here a negative value and it scales it to the other side. So this is just an optical thing, but it's maybe the way how I'm used to work. So um, this buckle here is now 20 millimeter deep. It's shown um, emphasized, so the buckle of course is smaller, but it looks like this. And why 20 millimeters? In Eurocode, for example, uh, you have to scale the buckle um, in, in a reference to the length of the buckle. So, um, for example, if you have a, a beam um, supported on both ends and you want to have, an, and you can imagine the curvature, so if it would be a beam, you would use something like length divided by 200 or length divided by 150. Actually, if you use the Eurocode 3, or the EN1993, 1.1 minus 5, you find here some hints how big those buckles have to be. And uh, if you use a plastic design, it should be one hundredth of the reference length. And the reference length is the um, distance of the uh, edge of the buckle, I would say. I can measure this here by using the measuring tool, distances between two nodes. And I can estimate here, from here, maybe to here. And the distance is about 1.9 meter. So roughly, I figure 2 meters divided by 100 is 20 millimeters of um, scaled uh, value. Um, I also could say I use this distance and would have a less scaling, but um, there is a little bit of discussion like how to do this and which values to take into account. So I'd rather go a little bit on the safe side and make the buckling, the buckle a little bit uh, deeper. Okay, I have now my imperfect shape. How to apply it into the analysis? I copy the load case, so I have a comparison. Copy load case to load case two and I call it with imperfection. In this load case, now I edit and in the calculation parameters I apply, I could apply second order analysis which is a like more simple uh, full analysis, higher order analysis which is of linear nature actually or I can also use a little bit better analysis which is the large deformation analysis which is a based on a newton raphson iteration and it also uh, it gives a little bit better results um, once you have um, more correct results once you have uh, strains, larger strains and larger deformations. So I have it available so why not use it. Um, and also I activate extra options and when I do this I get a new table here and in this table I can activate generated imperfections from add-on module RF imp and I choose the case that I have defined there. So when I run now the analysis I'll apply the imperfect structure and I do a nonlinear analysis uh, on this imperfect structure. Okay let's run the analysis and calculate it and now we will see again a little bit higher um, amount of iterations and you can follow here also the displacement scheme and you see here uh, that iterations will be more as closer we get to the uh, highest load level. Again I chose three load increments um, Depending on the structure you're doing, you might need a little bit more or less. Okay, then after a while I should get some results and we'll take a look then again at the stress distribution and deformation to see if we really applied the imperfect structure. So you see it's more iterations because there is probably some more yielding going on because I have not a perfect structure anymore. 
and if you have a lot of finite elements it can be a time consuming thing and it's also even with today's calculation options and computers uh, it's not so simple to analyze a 3d building for example in such such a way okay we see here now a different picture um, not so much symmetric anymore and we see here the sigma max von Mises and we see here a lot of red which is now we see the stress which is below 23.5 but we see here a lot of dark stress and we see here that there is um, similar to my imperfection uh, a lot of plastification or it's close to plastification let's look at the criterion design ratio is here close to one and we can use a non-linearity rate and we see there is some yielding going on in wide areas of this web um, also we should again check the stresses and they are now also higher and um, we are almost above the limit uh, what we allow and this here is a very slender structure so I don't know if we should really build it in reality and do some more stiffening but the principle like this is uh, it's good for these two for showing the principle how we do such um, design and now you can based on this you can decide whether you introduce more stiffness whether you change web thickness and so on uh, maybe we also take a look of this load case um, take a look in the direction of deformation and direction y and we see here it follows the the bar uh, the buckle that i have uh, defined as pre-deformation so it seems to be right and through this imperfection we get an extra um, we get an extra bending moment and extra stresses into the structure okay this is the principal way of how to do such a design um, as i said you have if you have other buckling modes that are close or just above one or below ten you should consider also those um, imperfection modes and make different cases of imperfection um, and check if everything is fine. It could be that in even higher um, buckling modes we find instabilities because of yielding. We have a high nonlinear effect and it could be that the model is not stable anymore. So you have to check several buckling uh, modes. Okay, this is what I had prepared for you to show today in this um, um, webinar today and I'd like to continue with the um, PowerPoint. Um, I know that Robert is uh, answering uh, many questions and maybe there is time also to talk about a few questions before I end the webinar and maybe I take a look what we have here um, there was the questions like where can I set the increments of the um, iterations the load increments I go back to our fan you can do this here in the calculation parameters um, and here is a setting you can do it for load cases or for load combinations and here it sets to three or to five um, for load combinations for example because we have an iterative um, analysis there is also a maximum number of iterations that has to be set here um, it's at 200 so if you reach that limit you will also receive a message um, that uh, there is not fully iterated um, also maybe um, if you have non-linearities non like material models you can disable them here in the calculation parameters um, this is maybe helpful if you have instability and you want to know is the instability caused by a material nonlinearity. you can deactivate it for some time for some trials uh, also you can set here 
the solver options, 64-bit, for example. Uh, some may ask what is the plate bending theory behind RFM. There is Mindlin and Kirchhoff that you can select here. Um, yes, I think those are the most uh, important uh, options here. Um, there was also a question, can I also model bolted connections? Uh, I have shown this in previous seminars. Uh, please refer to the website. Uh, on our website there are the recordings from the older webinars and um, there are some about uh, steel connections. Um, often you have uh, contact elements that are needed for such um, models. Um, so you have two plates that are pressed together by bolts and if there's tension they they might uh, form a gap. So with contact elements you can do this and contact elements are a subset of solids that we also employ in, include inside uh, RFM. And they are in the standard version. Um, which material models are in the default RFM version and which are in RF mod NL? Um, in the default version you have uh, the isotropic linear elastic and the autotropic elastic 2D. All the other models are, um, are set free if you uh, have RF mod NL. Then there was another question, what about post-critical analysis? Can you handle a snap-through problem? Uh, in the calculation parameters, uh, not in the calculation parameters, in each load case, if you edit a load case, you have here the option to see, to set geometrical linear, second order large deformation and post-critical analysis. Uh, post-critical analysis is um, if you, um, if the, if the uh, yeah, for example, a, a snap-through problem, if you have a, a von Mises um, truss and you lose stability because it snaps through to the other side, um, then it's a little bit difficult for the solver to find uh, a stable solution again of the equation system and if you have a post-critical, uh, if you have a snap-through problem, you use the post-critical analysis option and that uh, should help you find this solution. Okay, then there is one more question. What about fatigue design in uh, steel analysis? So if you want to do fatigue design, uh, we don't have a specific module at the moment. We, we're planning to have one, but it's not yet uh, available. But what you can do now is, if, uh, if you have the RF steel surfaces module, which is part of the RF steel module, um, you can set here um, stresses, uh, sigma, delta. Uh, I think they are only available if we have several load cases. Hang on, I'll have to change a little bit. Um, details. Sigma equivalent sigma 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 sigma. Um, you can get. Um, we we cannot do a fatigue design, but uh, we can uh, give you the uh, stresses stress ranges. Here it is. I'm sorry. I have. There's a new table, stress ranges. And if you get the stress ranges, that means you get um, the difference from the lowest to the highest stress, which is a input figure for most of the fatigue, fatigue design codes. So you need to know um, the variation of the stress. Is it only compression? Is it only tension? Is it maybe compression and tension? And the stress range is an important um, figure for this and we can give this here as a result. So it's possible to do that. 
Okay, I think this is it with the um, questions. Um, before we finish this webinar, I would like to point out our website. On our website, you find a lot of information. Uh, also, we post this information on uh, our social media channels. Please tune in there if you want to. I'd like to point out a few things on the website, mainly the Dlubar blog, which is available here on the right side when you start dlubar.com. In the Dlubar blog, you see here um, tips and tricks and hints for the software every day. We post some new things, uh, different languages. You can search here um, non-linear maybe and you get some hints to this using non-linear elastic material for example. You can um, browse through here and get some hints and uh, ideas uh, where to find things. So this is an important thing. Also you find here uh, downloads for trial versions. Please do not hesitate to download those. They work for 30 days. Um, you can check out uh, all the options. Um, when you work with the trial versions, visit the first step page where you find hints about introductory examples, tutorials, and also hints for manuals, webinars, and so on that you can visit. Yes, and finally, I'd like to uh, inform you about the next webinar, which will be on November 14th, uh, which will be about tips and tricks using our FAM. And um, I'd like to invite you, and at the same time, thank you for being with us today. Thank you also, Robert, for answering the questions. And I hope you have a nice day, and see you again one time on the webinar channel. Bye-bye.